From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. Another piece of President Biden's response here is that he's promising to release another 10 million barrels of oil in November from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And Manet, do you think that's a real response or is that a political effort to be seen doing something? Well, it does a tiny bit, obviously. I mean, President Biden is pledging to release quite a significant amount from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And obviously, that's going to increase the supply that's available to U.S. consumers. And I think economists who have tried to gauge its impact disagree. It's very difficult to pin down exactly the impact that it has on gas prices um, and other forms of oil consumption. But there's no doubt that it has some impact. Certainly, Biden is doing it more for political purposes. One to show that he's doing something, even though he knows that the effect is going to be minimal, but it's going to have some effect. But I think there's a bigger question about how wise it is and how justified he is in making the decision to release oil at this particular time. And I think you can compare it with the spring when we had Russia invading Ukraine and the rest of the world deciding that it was going to reduce its consumption of Russian oil, that was a real completely unpredictable shock. That's the kind of thing that the Strategic Petroleum Reserve theoretically exists for, sort of to make sure that we can keep steady consumption when there are these global shocks. Right now, the reduction of production that is coming from OPEC is completely conventional. Basically, they're projecting that demand is going to decrease around the world. And they're saying we want to produce less oil because that's going to guarantee that we can get the best price for the oil that we're putting out and we're not oversupplying. So I think that it's clearly a political misuse by President Biden to be adding capacity or rather to be drawing on the Strategic Petroleum Reserve for basically just a completely predictable economic shift. And in fairness, he is not the only president to use the Strategic Petroleum Reserve that way. But personally, I'm skeptical that this has much of an effect on oil prices or gas prices. I mean, the Biden announcement is 10 million barrels released in November, I believe. And the U.S. consumes about 20 million barrels of oil per day. Every drop helps, I suppose. But that is not really a market moving amount of oil to be putting on the market. The other point that Manet raises, I think it's a good one. This is the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And when the historical norm in the last several years has been to have about 650 million barrels of oil in there, somewhere around there. And we're getting close down now to more like 400 million barrels. And so, Kim, I mean, is this a concern that if we use the strategic reserve in this way when we are worried about rising gas prices, is it emptying a strategic asset we might need if there really is a crisis, a real shock coming down the road? It's a huge concern, and the administration is starting to get some real criticism from people in the industry and national security specialists for this move. As of a week ago, we had drawn down more than 160 million barrels. That puts it at about a quarter of what it normally stands at. This is the lowest level the SPR has been at for 40 years. And as you mentioned, we have this facility so that if there is some sort of global oil shock, the United States has the ability to maintain and not necessarily have to turn the lights off if there really is a situation that is very, very dire. Now, even in a best capacity, as you mentioned, demand is such in the United States that even if you were to release that oil out of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve at a much faster rate, it would still only buy us a little bit of time. At the capacity it's at now, there are some very legitimate concerns that it would not really be able to serve the function it exists to serve, which is that backstop. The other thing is, is while this might be a small amount that goes out into the economy every day, cumulatively, this adds up to quite a bit. And some analysts are talking about how it could be years for us to actually be able to get all the capacity necessary to restore it to its prior levels. So I think that there's a real kind of risk here of just politically using this as a tool in such a way that really could produce some very scary national security concerns. Finally, let's turn to the jobs report on Friday. And in September, the economy added a net 263,000 jobs. It seems that the economy is cooling a little bit. That compares to 315,000 in August and a monthly average during the first half of the year of 400,000. And let's listen to a bit of President Biden responding to this jobs report. Our job market continues to show resilience 
as we navigate through this economic transition we're in. For some time, I've been saying that what we need to do in this transition, we have to move from historically strong economic recovery to a more steady, stable recovery. We need to bring inflation down without giving up all the historic economic progress that working class and middle class people have made. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Manet, what's your read of these job numbers and what else we're learning about the economy? And in particular, I'd note that the first half of this conversation, if oil prices go up, that obviously affects the economy in ways that can be a little hard to predict. Right. I suppose the way to read the economic data of the past week is that the labor market and the economy are still quite hot, but perhaps starting to cool. And so you saw, for example, earlier in the week, the JOLTS numbers, which track the number of jobs openings, decreased by quite a lot. They were at around 11 million in the prior month, and this month decreased to about 10 million. So a drop off of about a million, which is historically large. It's the biggest decrease that we've had in a single month since the beginning of the pandemic and is historically large compared with any kind of one month decrease we might have seen before the pandemic. And so that shows that employers are expecting that they're going to be hiring fewer people in the coming months. But Simultaneously, we saw that hiring actually was still pretty strong in this month. And so that shows that in the short term, employers still believe that there's a lot of demand that they need to meet. They need to bring workers on in order to produce enough to keep up with existing demand. So I think it kind of seems like we're at an inflection point. On the one hand, there's still pretty robust growth. Unemployment reached a low since the pandemic at 3.5% now, but the direction is kind of starting to change. And so people who are predicting that there's an economic slowdown coming and people who have been tracking the impact that the Fed's interest rate increases have had on the economy seem to be spot on. The direction is starting to change. Kim, what's your read of this jobs data? And do you see in it anything that would or should convince the Federal Reserve to take its foot off the brake as it considers what the interest rates should be and how much they should rise in coming months? Well, the market certainly wants the Fed to believe that. You know, it was notable we had a couple of days where people were buying and bidding up stocks. These numbers came out and the market had another terrible day. And that's the market trying to send a message to the Fed. Too much pain, too much pain. Look at these numbers. It's already really bad. You don't need to raise rates another 75 points. I will be curious to see what the Fed does. Yeah, there is a unique balance here. But as we have noted for quite some time, it waited so long that it essentially guaranteed that there was going to have to be some real pain to get it back. I'm not quite sure you can really try truly lower those inflation rates without some further rate hikes and some aggressive ones as well, too. We'll see if the Fed sticks with its course. We're also going to have to take a look at the other indicators in terms of inflation, what's still going up and how bad it is, and then we'll see. But this is certainly a sign, as Manet said, that certain things are cooling, but whether or not it's really cooled enough that it is worthy of the Fed stopping its plan, I think that's a very big question. But this is an incredibly difficult situation, I think, to be in if you are in the Federal Reserve chairman's seat, because on the one hand, there is this risk of recession that's looming, and there are some Democratic members of Congress, and I'm thinking in particular of Elizabeth Warren, who are warning the Fed in pretty political terms that if you cause a recession and throw people out of work, it will be your fault. And on the other hand, the economists, I think, are warning that if they take the foot off the brake too soon, you may end up with a bit of a recession without actually dealing with the underlying inflation problem. And then you end up in the worst of both worlds. And you have to go back later and raise rates even more again to try to get the inflation ultimately under control. Manet, we'll give you the last word. Yeah, I think it's just important to remember that all recessions are not created equal. I mean, when people hear the word recession, they tend to have memories of the Great Recession within the past couple of decades and mass unemployment a really long time before people started hiring again, before people's wages were rising, uh, the collapse in housing prices and other kind of economic calamities of that kind. What we're beginning to see now is kind of an economy that really surged, was hotter than at any point in recent memory coming out of the pandemic lockdowns when hiring was extremely strong, when there were record numbers of job openings, when nominal wages were rising extremely fast. And so we might, because of interest rate increases, enter a period where 
we do see negative growth, where we do see layoffs even. But we have to remember that the baseline we're coming from is one that was an extremely hot economy where a lot of people were able to advance in terms of their wages. Obviously, inflation was eating into those advances, but still, we were coming from a historically strong, a historically hot economy. And so balancing the risk of recession against the need to get prices under control, it still seems like there hasn't been any development yet that should convince the Fed to not keep the priority on keeping inflation under control. Thank you, Manet and Kim. Happy Friday to one and all. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button. Wall Street Journal members can also join Paul Jugo, Kimberly Strassel, and Carl Rove for a live opinion event, Can Republicans Retake Congress, on Monday, October 17th at 7 p.m. That will be in Dallas or streamed online. And for more information, go to wsjplus.com slash opinion live for tickets and more information. And as always, we'll be back here next week with another edition of Potomac Watch.